All right. Feeling better today than I did yesterday, so. Uh, uh. Feeling better than yesterday. We're going up to Butler, a little bit of a late start. Um, and we're good. So far, so good. Had a beautiful geese this morning. Wow. Kind of like blowing buffalo in the uh, high tide. And then uh, we'll see how it goes. At some point, I'll get my stone back. The ocean's taken from me right now. Apparently, she has other things to do. <laughs> so, you know, it's good to have a sense of proportion. It's not all about me and my stone, apparently, according to the Pacific Ocean the tidal forces and so forth. I know it's a shock, but I'm dealing with it. Fortunately, it's not the most difficult thing I have to deal with right now, so I made a nice little altar for my dad with the little jewels the ocean gave me one day while a white woman was sexually assaulting me, because that's what they do. White culture is a colonized, colonizing culture. It's a colonizing force in the world. So all white people are hostile. They're hostile to life. They're a colonizing force to protect themselves, right? Their beautiful brains have been turned into parasites. So they have lots of mental blood parasites. It's putrefying. They bring death wherever they go. Look at these lifeless neighborhoods. Do you hear any cultural music? Hey, do you hear any cultural music? Do you see any culture and art in any of these houses? Hey, anything but these blank, weary rooftops. Right, some white person closed this gate. I can walk here, but apparently they don't think it's safe enough for anyone to walk down here. Who would be stupid enough to walk there and fall in that shit? I have no idea. And, uh, try to look around these white towns, see if there's any culture, see if there's any joyful music anywhere. You know? Nothing. Nothing. You never hear anything. You've been sitting out in their garden, staring at this guy, or... You know, you see horses, I never see anyone riding them, you know? One of the only times I saw one riding a horse in any of these areas, they called the uh, environmental wardens and then the police on me. The next time they even saw me to make sure that I didn't look at their butt too much. <sighs> because they came around a hedge and I happened to be looking at a river or something. So that's how important the female asshole is. I came into a coffee shop with a woman who looked like, I said to her, like she was dressed like a porn star. With a big fat ass. And I got a coffee from them. After I did them a favor, telling them to raise their prices. Because they were new to the area. Right? To come into parity with other stores. Then they became a store that was way overinflated for what you got. In any sense, they made me a cup of coffee. And... She alerted me that I, quote, shouldn't look at her asshole, because apparently that's what she thought I was doing, because I smelled my coffee and said, mmm. So apparently having normal reflexes about the smell of coffee delivered to you kindly in the coffee shop is enough to make a woman standing in front of you to think that you want to penetrate her asshole. So I created an imaginary app that allows me to see when and where her asshole might devise that I'm, 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 I'm contemplating penetrating her anal tube. <laughs> it's almost impossible to go in a store and make sure that a white woman can't accuse you of wanting to ass fuck her or do her doggy style based on sounds you might emit. You know what's interesting about this is that the next time I came in and I'm stupid enough to do so, her female partner was wearing a see-through blouse and a purple bra. And she, the other girl seemed very interested in flirting with me even more because apparently that's how she flirts. White people flirt like sociopaths by humiliating you in public for something you haven't done. Just like a child. Right? Just like a child. Right? So they can run a business that I wouldn't reproduce with her. Right? You know? How suddenly if their asshole is anywhere near you, you have to worry about them calling the police. It's got a laser coming out of their butt. Like God. Like Saron. To see if they can possibly accuse you of any kind of feelings which are private in your mind of wanting to ask fuck up right they can read your mind they can accuse you of things they know everything they need to know based on the way you smell your coffee man i think you know too much about me you're a mind reader i wanted to hop on the counter and stick my dick up your pussy and ass as quickly as i could 
That's all I could think about. Like a wild raging bull. How can I? And then the next time he's like, he's like, but let's go through the, let's go through the proper channels until I can get my dick into your inner channels. What are you saying? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. What violent sexual predators. Imagine this type of fucking fat fucking piece of shit around children. Yeah, these are ugly cunts. Right? They probably believe in organic food, too. These fucking disgusting bitches. Right? White people are disgusting all the time, but people don't notice them. Because they're so busy making men feel bad for having a dick. Right? Or smelling their coffee or whatever the fuck comes next. Right? funny story you know and the lady I, that worked there before her she was a psychopath and so on and so on before the previous owners right and so, yeah. 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 Well, um diddly diddly. hi morning um but you know, if I played my cards right, I could be doing it right now. Now let me tell you a little bit about TV shows. I've got a couple of little snippets. One from the X-Files, where this child, it's, it's imaginary, ethereal, supernatural crime, okay? So just flow, work with me here. And this child is being able to decode little snippets of satellite messages into ones and zeros. And the NSA investigate him ravage his room, find any kind of material he might have deciphered from a satellite transition in his mind, <laughs> and uh, something to do with UFOs or something. And, uh, and they show you these sheets of ones and zeros. Right? And I just made, finished making a video saying that all of white culture is basically the name of God over and over again. And they take these ones and zeros and say, oh, it's just ones and zeros. This is back in the 80s and 90s. But you can translate them into almost anything. So one of his pages of ones and zeros is a DNA helix. The other is a piece of classical music. The other is a picture of the Vitruvian man, or what they call the universal man. It's not the universal man, it's the Vitruvian man. It's an architectural word. Okay, let's just be clear about it. Right, because the Messiah is a financial instrument of death. The Vitruvian man is basically a, a financial instrument. Instrument of death, hence the word the end. Right? A true asshole, essentially. Which is why he's in a circle. He's the universal asshole, the universal soul. Okay. Right? A code of ones and zeros is basically just the number 10 or the number 11 over and over. Think about it. Right? I'm watching a show from 2024 in Prime Video that's from like 1990. You see, it's everywhere. Then there's a show with two Catholic people whose children are getting into the car, they have phones. And the girl is mad because she says her little brother has a phone that can, he can track her with. And he says, if I find out you're tracking me, the little girl says, I'm going to murder you in your sleep. And the mom, a devout Catholic, devout Catholic, and the father say, no one in this family, no one's tracking anyone. But says nothing about the threat to murder her little brother when he's sleeping. The threat of murder means nothing to them. Right. right. White people have a figure of speech like, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to murder you. Right? And you notice in the family they're very hot blooded and have trouble controlling their emotions. Right? It's not just characters in the show, it's all white people. Right? Because it's a homicidal culture. It's a homicidal god, and the god is the god of the culture. The question, Christians, is how much do you really believe in the god? Because to me, he is everywhere. He controls all crime in the entire culture. He's an awesome God indeed. He pronounces everything a sinner and collects all human suffering and humiliation in the name of the wages of sin. Which is, by the way, your name as a fucking financial fucking instrument of his giant, all-encompassing asshole that pronounces everything a bag of shit filled inside a placenta with a twin who's actually a life whose life is worth anything, nothing except devoting it, Senor Numa, to the exoskeleton of the legal self and all the cosmetic alterations you need to work and fuck and leave home 
and be a good-looking orphan until you're dead. So good luck with your fucking God. But I'll take wind and fire and rain any fucking day. I love my mother, I love the earth, and I love nature. All right, that's my rain for the morning, but it's just, it's everywhere. Right, Malton and Scully, Scully, I believe, are gender reverse. So his sister wasn't abducted. Like Adam and Eve, he just became a man, the way Adam becomes a woman. Right? Here. The ultimate cosmetic alteration is the transvestite. The Vestal Virgin is a transvestite. They are both male and female. Right? So a transsexual is just a virgin. A virgin is already transsexual. Right? Okay. There we go. Like as male or female, you're just a delivery from God, the giant asshole that goes from the tiniest hole in the universe and advances itself in, in, in advance of all of life. The earth is just a tiny dot, a novelty of life that God left like a little Petri dish of shit that wasn't as dead as the other shit. Okay? Now try having fucking morals. Right? Can your brain even do fucking long division at this point? Yeah, so... Not that that's going to help you. Because it is a long division. It's a division after division after division that goes on forever. And so the, the, the addition or the multiplication of any of its articles of faith are always approaching zero. Which is accomplished in so much as Christ or you were born a complete zero to begin with. Taking as many non-zeros with you as possible. Well, I definitely feel stronger today. You got the energy of harmony, you got the lynx, you got the dragonfly, you got the mouse. Passed by one representative predator today. Not too bad. There's the leather gibbo, the kiss of the sun, and the kiss of the sun. See? Nature is sound. What is Satanism? It's all things being sound. Let everything is sound. Let everything sound for be sound. You know? As long as it's sound, in terms of yourself, right? Everything is your God in being sound. Because everything that's sound is a God into itself. Right? Yeah. The idea, the Christian idea of having one God that has nothing to do with life, and, and whom you could never be rectified to, and whose dream of life is accomplished by sending his son to be killed, pieces of whose body, like pieces of time, you must consume, utterly, at the cost of eventually losing your own life. Right? And that's why you die. You die with sin. Not because of like any other process. You deserve to die. You're given the mercy of earning something so that beyond death, you might eventually cease to suffer in the land of the dead or heaven. Yeah. That God rules over. Right? It's a completely barbaric prison system of the human mind. And in it, you might construe the sophistication of such a mind as might be imprisoned by mere suggestion. <laughs> oh God, I've spent so much time learning how to talk about these things. I'm now good for nothing. It's called specialization. Imagine the animals that decide of getting a, um, <laughs> a repulsible thumb. You know, what else did they do? They just pick their nose or something. You know? I want to declare that everything is snot. You just can never get it all out. Nos, nos trill, nos trill. Right? You get the eleven, nos trill, five, and six, and eight. So nos becomes death, like the sun backwards, the dead sun, the nos, the gnosis. <gasps> five. Six, seven, eight, 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 eleven. Nostril. The ring of death. And then it's gone. Oh, and there's two of them. Eleven, eleven. So your nostril is the name of God. I got God in my hands. Who knew? Who knows? <laughs> Whoa! Stop it. People don't understand what you say. They are lost in the world 
of Machiavellian proportions. I don't know what that means. This just sounds cool. <laughs> Biblical. Biblical. You know, the, the, the best film, the funniest but yet most entertaining film I ever watched was San Andreas Fault, <laughs> whatever it's called, San Andreas. My God. And it actually says in the warning, that it's got full of mayhem. <laughs> I just, I couldn't wait to watch this. It's like, <sighs> and then the lead actor and actress get better looking as the film progresses. Why? Because they're dead and they're becoming cosmetically enhanced with the approach, with the advance of the plot. The more people die, the better looking they get because they are robed in the raiment of death. Yeah, everyone on TV is dead. Everyone in movies is already dead. Characters are already dead. They're ghosts. All characters are ghosts. They're, you're seeing how they used to be. You're seeing them. They're all dead. All actors are dead. You're seeing their lives in review. Not as they're happening. Because even as they're happening, they're nearly ghosts. It's fascinating. The stage is only a place for dead people. It's like heaven. And it's liberating, almost like death, to become an actor and grace the stage and take on the pallor of the sea of troubles. To gain magical powers, which no mortal would otherwise have, but that they accepted their own fate and earned their bread by acting their role, acting properly. Act properly now. Act like property. Act properly and act like private Every act is an act of God. It's a miracle. Mari ko. It's basically two words for death. Mariko. Right? Wayne Dyer, he's a witch. He's a warlock, right? He tells a story, he gets a black woman to tell a story of being in a genocide in Africa and everyone's dying and getting beheaded and she just sits in this room and prays to God and she's covered by this angelic bubble that protects her from the stench of blood and fear and everyone leaves her alone as though she's invisible. This is a device, a form of lying used by um, another, a New Age writer named something Tamura and uh, writes about women with dolphins and stuff like that. Michael, Michael Tamura, I think his name is. And uh, they're just witches. They're liars, they're professional liars, right? right? Surrounded by death, right, is why she remained alive. You just have to lie to yourself and then you can survive anything. It's just like magic, it's like a miracle, right? And what does Wayne Dyer do? He comes out, he's been receiving chemotherapy and he says, I am perfectly healthy, even though he has cancer and dies of cancer. The last thing he does is declare a complete lie. You know, you should say, I want to be healthy and I don't want to die of cancer. But he doesn't do that because you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be positive. It's ridiculous. These are witches training you and your children how to think about your own fucking feelings, right? Wielding the jurisdiction of their predatory god over you. They don't wait for you to go to church. They do it every fucking day when you talk to a white person.
I notice on TV when an obvious criminal is caught, like red-handed. What is red-handed? It means you're caught in debt. That's how God, that's how God or Dad <laughs> imprisons everyone by catching you red-handed. He paints you red, and then you think of the red man, right? And red is debt. Red is the eleven, the bull sacrifice. And then you look at how white people treat red people, right? Like they can just fuck them whenever they want. Red people make white people horny. Horny to fuck them and rape them. We become absolute fucking primates around that. That's why they stay away from us. It's because we were trained like German shepherds to fucking live among them and then start fucking ripping them to pieces. We're fucking disgusting. That's the fucking disease, the homicide in the Bible prepared us for gen to be genocidal fucking mania. Right? And imagine all that blood going into the earth and all the screams of all the children we fucking murdered. And you come out, I get to come out in the forest and enjoy their land, scot-free. No one catches me red-handed. But God catches everyone red-handed in the end. We're all prisoners and criminals to God. It says so in his holy fucking book. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. It's funny how, like, you, be you can become more of a human by being Spider-Man than you can by being a man. That being a spider enhances your abilities. And all that blood, and yet the day after white Christians mutilated my body in my house, life went on. The sky, the sun, and everything was there, but my body and my mind had changed. See, Christians, their expression of Christianity is to mutilate people. See, they're natural stalkers and homicidal maniacs. All you have to do is let them. If you're stupid enough to be an honest, innocent person, and you, you give them the respect of being able to be in reasonable command of themselves, They'll fucking suck the life out of you. But you can't treat them badly. You can't treat them badly. And you can't treat them the way they are. So they always have an advantage over you. You have to treat them like they're fucking healthy humans. You ever met a crazy person? You got to treat them like they're a healthy fucking human. And that gives them a fucking advantage. Even if someone doesn't like me or my channel, you don't have to spend time with me. I don't, I don't talk to you at the local coffee shop. Mm. A tasty beverage. No, my mom's doing well. My dad. I'm going to say he's doing well. <laughs> he's doing well in the ICU. It's kind of like, I see you, Dad. See you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> something was taken away from him. Something that took him away from me. Took me away from him. But the psychopath, which is like a, a psychopath in a sense, is the, the victim of ethnic genocide. And that was also in the X-Files. That was the previous episode. But it said that the ultimate victim of ethnic genocide becomes a cannibalistic serial killer. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. So you start to see the innuendo catches you red-handed. Like a monster that can go anywhere and kill people and eat their livers and then hibernate for 30 years. An immortal who lives in the land of the dead. It's an interesting characterization of the ultimate victim of ethnic genocide. And the things that we have done to other human beings. The white man brought murder into the world. That's what the English language is for, to bring murder onto the earth. I'm not talking about two people in a bar having a fight and someone 
you know, killing the other person, which is bad enough. <coughs> and that is part of it. But it's even more, even more broad. The study of murder to me should be the same as the study of the white race and all of our culture. It is the study of murder. I said to one person on a dating site, I said, on my family history, to me, studying my family history is like studying the crime scene of a murder. I said to my dad once, and he didn't really appreciate it, he was always being hostile to me, and I said, you're the murderer. I could have said, and probably should have said, you have murder in you. You could see why he didn't like me very much. Well, the thing is, I'm saying that because in a sense, the moment I said that, I'm acknowledging that he doesn't really give a shit about me. Why would I say that about him otherwise? I have to give a shit about someone who never gave a shit about me, or my mother but also is not capable of it. There's people who will not do things. There's people who are unable to do things, who will not do things because they are not able. You could ask the question, if he were able to love you, would he not have wanted to enjoy knowing you? And so on, yeah. If anyone were able to do that, what could possibly stop them? A different person. A dad isn't just someone who goes to work and puts food on the table, see? A dad is someone who has your back, is there for you, is there to guide you when you most need it. They're not there to make you unsafe, they're not there to be your enemy, they're not there like a character in a prison movie to say, you know, they gotta beat you to prepare you for the streets. They're not God. They don't get to humiliate you and you get to worship them for teaching them through humiliation things that they would otherwise not be able to learn. That's not normal. So the gnosis of the Christian is the gnosis of someone who never learns from their humiliations, but that they commend them to worship the God of all humiliation and all sin, and that gets rid of them all. It's not any real process of delivery, deliverance or healing. The truth is there is no atonement in Christianity. There is no forgiveness. It's more like a declaration of murder. It's a, it's a recapitulation. the whole epistemology. So I don't like God. You'll notice that crazy Christians like my dad, you know, they have a very particular relationship to this God figure. The way they have to people who even abuse them. Like their pimp, my dad's brothers could make fun of him. They never asked him about, he had four children, a wife, he was in a new country, managed to get a job after a few weeks, doing well, it's gotta be hard though. Work, life, children, marriage, it's not working. Never once said to him, I spent time with him. Hey, how's your work, how's your life, how's your boss, how's he treating you? Not once, they would make fun of him. They didn't want to come to our house because it wasn't clean enough for them. My dad lived as an abused child in his own family and he fucking worshipped them. It was like a cult. Because when you're being abused, worshipping the cult is all you have. Just like worshipping God heals you of all your humiliations. What could my dad possibly have done for me at that point? Right? If you get a job and you participate in the culture, you know, it's better. You don't have a father, but it's better, for sure. Because what is anything? It's the solution to the lost father. <coughs> Los Pedros. And then you get an exchange the godfather of the eternal dead. But if you write any kind of poetry about life and spring and winter and rebirth, the one time one of your Christian friends ever seems to see that you have any other part of your life that isn't what they precisely need it to be at any given time, none of which is interesting to them as it is, was or will ever be, that it's too much about death, while they worship the Lord of eternal death. Thankfully, you know, my God and my gods gave me a sense of irony. You know, it's, 
you have to have a developed sense of irony to live in this world, you know, and to really cleanse the sophisticated blood diseases, which are also kind of mental fuckery, right? There's a blood disease and the fuckery of the fuckery in training nature of the vortex and the sounding and repetition of the the the, um, the cursive language of a light man who says to himself over and over, I am good, I am good. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Prashakti Namaha. Om Namite Namaha. You want to find love? It's out there. Maybe. But for me, it's here. With my mother at home, buying poinsettias for winter, buying a tiny fake Christmas tree. And uh, this room, we have a tree, a cypress outside, exactly the same size. Uh, but uh, putting pine cones on white. Making dinner. And I don't do enough. And she never complains about me. And she encourages me in my life. And it's never to know specifically that my life and work is of any real use to her or ever will be. And in return, I dedicate it to her. I hate to watch her hurt. I hate to watch my mother sickened and to know that there is a deeply pathogenic uh, range of problems that run through all white people that have, in many cases, made my mother and me sick. That virology and, and so forth needs to be related to, in, in further, beyond that, maybe in, in the totality of the greatest knowledge in the world, the relationship between our blood and our environment and the land. And in particular, unfortunately, how white people relate to each other in the land as nothing but orphan castaways and collective refugees who, like myself perhaps, are never fully at home in one place, always looking for a port that death is really the ultimate real estate. Finally, you can know where you are. Heaven is, in that sense, knowing where you are. If you know where you are, where you are, you're halfway to knowing who you are. And even what you're supposed to do with your life. You're supposed to know where you are. You're supposed to want to be loved. You're supposed to want to imagine yourself capable of love. What is the self? but the imagination of one who is worthy of the utmost love and regard and of none of the humiliations and tortures that our flesh and blood have ever been forced to suffer, no matter how wonderfully quietly we can do so, no matter how many different wonderful things and beliefs billions have ever turned it into. It's simple, really. Less... is better. You put me around another white person, where do you find such a sanctity? But you allow someone to find the sanctity and they can share it with all the world. Anyone who knows what that feels like. None should ever feel excluded. They're not excluded from here because they're not excluded from this. This is whatever they need this to be in their own terms this peace or this sanctity, this sanctity which is mine and theirs, and mine alone and theirs alone, and whoever's it belongs to, it kind of figures itself out. And if you're around someone and their sanctity and your sanctity don't meet, then you pretty, sh you're pretty much you know that that's the thing you really know. And I don't appreciate what the white man thinks of, for the most part, sanctity. I have been thankful on my channel a couple times to have had listeners to, to make comments that indicate that people have some deep considerations of what is sacred to them. Some sometimes listen to me. That's pretty cool. 
like a guy I knew used to come down to the river. We could just be in the same section of river and not talk for a half an hour. No hellos, nothing. Just to know that one is good with another man. Less is better. There is no war here. And yet other white people, they can walk by you in the summer and look at you and make you skin crawl and make your heart beat in your chest like a, like a tiny rabbit. And to know that if you say anything, they're only going to erupt in violence. And probably accuse you of being a complete weirdo. They are right on the edge of psychosis. And imagine how out of place they probably feel. In a sense, maybe we've answered our own question. Violence is being out of place. Violence comes from feeling out of place. When a child is ever put out of place in the world, there maybe violence enters in to any of our lives. And once we feel too out of place, maybe that's because violence has entered in. And in a sense, that makes it more likely that it could enter in to our lives in other ways and other times. Better to find your place. What is the sanctity from the wars of this world but to find some place sacred to you? Deal with the war there. Get angry there. Bitch and scream there. Do not share it in the wrong place with the wrong people. It's interesting when I get predators on my channel, stalkers, you might say bad comments, you know. <sighs> it's like they're taking time to tell me that they feel out of place in my world or that my world is out of place in their world. Like, why bother? Like, okay, I get it. I mean, isn't that really it? Yeah, I went, like, there are white people who go off, you know, dozens of miles into very dense nature through logging roads so they can find a bear and scare it away and talk about how beady its little eyes are or its children. Do you see the, the irony of that? What are you doing here, bear? What are you doing here? I think you're in the wrong place. You're where the white man is. And this idea when I'm sitting, when white people are around, I always feel like I'm in the wrong place. That's why I look side to side. I hope that the logs and the trees that have fallen are enough to block the white man. Not that I, and then I'm sure the best person to walk through here, anyone who comes through here is gonna be a good guy. Right? Anyone who comes through here will be a good person because they've made it through the logs. It's worth it to them. They prove that it's worth being here. Nature sees, wow, he likes this so much, he'll climb under all these logs, around all these logs. Or maybe it just proves to me how much I love it. Proves to me what I'm worth doing to be here and improving to myself how much I value this place. It maybe proves how valuable I am. And allows me to feel how much, how important this is to me. So a sacred place, a sense of belonging, if you can find it, in nature. I first found it, in many respects, in my early 20s, thanks to a book by Francesca de Grandi, uh, self-proclaimed Celtic fairy witch, where she develops what she calls the third path, road of witchcraft, and uh, teaches you how to build an altar really easygoing writer. I liked it. I don't really like her as a person anymore, but I think she's a bit of a charlatan, to be honest with you. But they have to sell books. Uh, but if, if anyone, any witch or anything that has written anything, I would still recommend Francesca de Grandi. Nothing personal, I just, you know, she abides Christians. And once I learned that, I was like, fuck you, you bitch. <laughs> I was like, you're not a witch. How could a witch abide Christianity? That's like, an oncologist abiding, smoking 10 cartons of cigarettes every day. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't buy any of that pagan Christian shit, you know? The pagan Christ. Oh, okay. Ooh, it was an archaic symbol of the sun. Ooh, he's actually the Lord Pan. He's Oberon. <laughs> He's the sun and the lion and the witch in the wardrobe that dies and comes back to life, so his murder suddenly means something and isn't as bad as it might otherwise be. Pretty much when anyone is actually murdered. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I mean, fuck you. 
Has anyone else noticed that Tylenol is lonely backwards? <laughs> I feel very proud of that. When I was sick the last time, or a, year, a couple of years ago, I've had, in my life, I've, I, except beyond, you know, maybe 10 or 12 years old, I never really had, I had, you know, my share of sicknesses and flus and colds, but then it's just like, I stopped getting them, which is great. And then in the last, uh, I had a, a flu, in, I think in 2005, for about two weeks living with this creepy woman. Uh, but um, I imagine in some sense now it was like I got it from where I was at the time. But uh, And then uh, a couple years ago and this year, my mom and I both got a serious cold. She more serious than I. And uh, man, fuck me if, um, you know, these the pathogenic influences, they've passed. The purpose of the nine, the last nine moons that I've been doing as a witch is to, is to make our home stronger. You know, it's like it's in our living in an apartment building with white people. The walls are not thick enough. You got to make your own walls. You know what I mean? I've become the architect of walls. <laughs> I think I've personally caught three or four different people staring in our windows at different times. Who, by the way grow to loathe me <laughs> utterly to the ends of the earth and get other people to do the same in a way that breaches my personal and physical and health and has led to me being humiliated and threatened and sexually assaulted in public half a dozen times over the last half a dozen years so yay white people you know keep going fat fucking women i love you you know you know in fact there's, there's a lot of nice fat people but not around here you know i love fat people I do. I, you're especially gay fat people. I love gay fat people. Gay fat men are just like the best. <laughs> you know? No one is... It's like I would never hurt such a person. You know, not that I hurt people, but it's like really soft, gentle, sensitive, and yet they've got a nice... They've got like a real manliness to them too, you know? Sometimes gay men are, to me, more manly than regular men because they're more balanced. Not that just because you're gay, you're emotionally balanced. I mean, hoo hoo, <laughs> goodness me. <laughs> you know, I don't think gay people would say they're emotionally balanced when you consider the drama they go through <laughs> continually. But, but you know, that's because their gayness is developing. Imagine gayness in the future. People would probably be like me. I'm the gay man of the future. <laughs> I'm starting my own pride parade in the future. I'm, I'll be the head of it. Dun, dun, dun. I am gay. I am gay. <laughs> but in a new, more sophisticated way. <laughs> I eschew the bum, I love the sun, and right now, there's only one. <laughs> uh, what do I know? I, I don't know about regular sex. So. Uh, I still, I'm okay, like I like gay people on TV, you know, and, like, and uh, they, they have hookups too. You know, and like white people in all TV shows, of course, have to fuck. They like, it's basically the kingdom of horny rabbits constantly. Um, and so, of course, once a gay person has a, you know, a boyfriend or something, it's like you can't really judge them. <laughs> and then I, they, they say they've had sex. I try to figure out which one I think is on top and the bottom based on their body language, you know, and I'm not sure. And then I give up because I figure it's like calculus, you know, I'll never figure it out. <laughs> And it doesn't, it wouldn't even matter if I did. So, so, so I don't think about it. And it's, it's, it humanizes it, right? Because if I just think bum fucking is just, you know, that's not what you want to think. I wouldn't want to dress a, a arena filled with gay people. I notice I say arena, not like George Baseman. No, no, I'm ambitious with my fantasy arenas. It's so ridiculous, hey, that I could never be talking to an entire arena. Oh, can It's like game seven of the Stanley Cup and the Canucks finally get in. Oh, Canada, my home and native. Psh, fuck it, it's native. What the fuck? All right. The world is a vampire. Hey, Mark Messier, drain a few shots for us, eh? I know you don't play anymore, eh? But uh, put those teeth back in and uh, Let's see some, let's see some senior citizen Mark Messier action. You can bring your colostomy bag with you. <laughs> oh, come on. That's not worthy. Robin Williams has done that. Yeah. He talks about old war veterans throwing their colostomy bags at each other after having too many drinks. <laughs> That's not good. 
um, trust me, having a crossing bag is bad. You don't want one. They're painful. Painful on the skin. Constantly painful. Just, it's constant pain, really. I'll keep my regular butthole, thanks. And I, I, I suppose I, you know, I'm so irreverent. I should say thank you, of course, to all the soldiers who have died for me. So that I could sit here and do this and Nazis and, you know, aren't, you know, walking along the trail going, hey, why are you here? That's not even how a Nazi sound. I don't care. Why are you here? Why? Why? Oi, e, radio in. What is this? He starts touching me. You look like Odin. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, thanks for that. Every man and woman who gets their butt shot off is basically doing something because they're doing it. Someone else doesn't have to do it, right? It's kind of weird, isn't it? It's like we're little bits of Ajax, you know, cleaning the, the violence of the world away. One human death at a time. How does that work? So the ultimate war, wouldn't it clear all unnecessary death and torture? And, you know, is anyone working on that, by the way, at DARPA? Hey, DARPA, Google, are you working on that? I'm sure somebody's working on that. We have worked on it. That's why I get to sit here. dreary town. The forest is more exciting than anything these people could possibly have to offer. No offense. Try having an intelligent conversation with any of the locals. I mean, fuck me. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the most intelligent person. I know. I know. Believe it or not. <laughs> believe it or not. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I really just feel so free. I can see clearly now my mind is gone. I don't even care. I don't even know what obstacles in my path are. <laughs> what would such a thing appear to be? <laughs> um, Maybe they will build on this land one day. Build a road, properties. They just haven't done it yet. It's getting cold. Ship is sailing. War is what number? That's right, eleven. War is hell. It is the number eleven. It's like we're going inside a museum of the English language and human and English consciousness. It's the ring of death. It's the name of God. The word. You are born, you are put into a, a ward. Which is a serious serious drawback. There is no going forth. There is no going forth. If there is, if there is a net forth, like there's, if there is a getting forth, what is it equal? Net force equals M A. Eight times 
seven, and sixteen and seven, which is eleven. So you can only go forth but with the ring you have. And what is the equal sign? Number eleven. So net forth is the name of God. In order to go forth, you can only go forth with the name of God. We saw it in the Bible. And it's consistent with Newton's law. I want to make up my own laws, or one of them. Rain's law. It's kind of like Cole's law. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's more nutritious. <laughs> it's not just a condiment. Now it's the main meal. <laughs> it's a slaughter. <laughs> Coal slaughter. Do we know the word slaughter has the word laughter? <laughs> man's slaughter? Man's slaughter and man's laughter are like joined together. Imagine getting charged with first degree man's laughter. <laughs> You're charged with first degree man's laughter. How do you plead? <laughs> Very carefully. There was, um, they, they helpfully, they number them. There's World War I and there's World War II, the war to end all wars. I'm not sure if they were both the war to end all wars, you know? Let's get rid of that war. <laughs> How are we gonna do that? I know, let's have a really big war. <laughs> and then we won't need any more ever again. <laughs> the war to end all wars. Wow. Now, what is that? Listen to that phrase, the war to end all wars. The war, war to 11-11, right? To what? Wend, wend, which is 5-5-10. Five, five, and five four nine, which is nine eleven. The war to wend all wars. The war to bind all wars together into what? Eleven eleven, the name of God. To spread the word, as it were. I wonder if the word Taylor Swift. Tay, lore. Tay, tail, lore. So a tail and a lore. There is two different words for a story. Right? Tail, lore. Lors, lore, tail, lore. What is a tailor? Someone who fits you for a costume. Lors Swift. And you get eleven two and eleven eleven. T Lors Swift. The name of God. The owner of all the cocktails. If I was a famous person, I wonder what my name would be like. I'd want to be like Purple Flower. And now, announcing Purple Flower. I don't think I sing like Purple Flower Cooking. What about um, John Wolf? Wolfenstein. <laughs> that sounds smart. Dr. Taylor Wolfenstein. <laughs> 
Taylor Swiftenstein. <laughs> I speak simply, swiftly, and always with great and voluminous meaning. When I talk, I make trees want to get stiffer. <laughs> Rocks to get harder. <laughs> the earth to want to be more fertile. <laughs> I am that I am. which is XX, which is 1010, which is 1111. You know, the hospital my dad is possibly passing away in is a hospital where I was born. I don't know what hospital my dad was born. I don't know. I know very little of his childhood. I know he had a dog at some point that he seemed to like. But something changed. He stuttered a lot, pigeon toed. He was scared. At school, they could strike your hand with a stick. I don't imagine. I remember in school, like, you know, the thing that you really like to me is feeling innocent, the idea of being punished by a teacher, much less this corporal punishment would sort of remove your innocence, really, wouldn't it? I mean, it's like, I've seen teachers locally who've told me, white psychopaths, mm -hmm. that they stalk young boys all their life, finding them culpable for anything, just squirming in their seat and then attacking them, you know, making sure they suck as much innocence out of them as possible. And unfortunately, the white mind is a monstrous thing. Predatory. Predatory. A lot of white people don't realize they're predatory. We live at their mercy. I live at the mercy of the white man and his predatory nature. I know his dad took the family rabbit and cooked it. That must have been a very unhappy event, to put it mildly. Even Captain Obvious would probably be quiet at that point. A single tear would come in. No wonder my dad punched me at the dinner table. His humiliation came to the surface, and when it did, my humiliation, he spread it to me and it was it came to the surface of my face. His dad didn't just kill the family pet, humiliated him, took another bit of his innocence away. And you go outside, and the sky is still the same. You can take your children on a canoe ride. You can get a new car, you can get married. Have sex, get a job and a suit, and the sun still moves, and you can just see the moon in the sky, or hire a prostitute from time to time, as my dad, I believe, did.
remember the first time I was probably like 20 years old walking across town as far as I could go, farthest I ever walked, because I'd found a candy store where I had basically haste. This was my big sexual coming out, so I could buy a Playboy magazine. And in the Cole Smith, December 19, figure it out, whatever year it was. My first porn magazine. I later would target other, usually oriental food stores, scan the back shelves. You soon discover that the plastic covered ones like Hustler have uh, more yoo-hoos and tatas and more penetration, you know? You know, they should actually have a salesman, like, you know, <laughs> you go into a store, it's like, well, here we have this, and it's very airbrushed, very nice, and these are some bountiful women, to be sure, you know. Um, the Playboy Mansion has boasted ne'er better than this. Enough to butter your bread from here till St. Christmas Day. <laughs> but over here, <laughs> in this protective plastic, lays levels of penetration that your young mind will as yet not even be able to fathom. You will literally explode just looking at it. <laughs> you won't be able to turn the pages fast enough. You're like, why would there be writing in this thing? You never yet connect to why they have ads for hard liquor at the back or personal ads for prostitutes and escorts. It's not hard to see what my dad was looking for after his marriage was up and his business was going fuck. Female company. I don't think my dad was really into sex. Humiliation has a way of sticking around. It's a, it's a good word, isn't it? Ambulance in the back. I found it a very helpful word, more helpful than Jesus Christ, or God, is humiliation. They didn't teach me that word in Sunday school, but yet my family had never been taught anything more deeply, more, there's nothing more dangerous, really, than humiliation, because it turns to homicide in the blood, it turns to shit. Think of all the unwanted, if, if there ever was a wanted homicide the non-war homicide, and the homicides of the homicides of war, and fatherlessness, and indigence, and grief that just closes up its own wound. If by yourself, things aren't good with this or that or this person, and life has moved on in a bad way for you, it is a way of kind of sealing itself up. You don't connect how you live with why you live that way, in so much as it it's like a depth of pain you can't feel. So it makes it feel like it's going away. You're better off alone. Better off, better off than not being sure is to just cut the cord. Now I know that some people have nice lives and that I probably wouldn't understand that. And that's fine. That's, that's cool. You know, as I look for my... Oh, God, I'm so, I'm so stoned right now, I'm so sorry. This is like, I just stoned. I don't know where my other lighter is. I'm like, fuck. What are you doing, man? <laughs> well, it could be in here. <sighs> well, it can't have gone far, can it? I mean, There it is. It's down there. Um, ethnic cleansing. Humiliating. To be singled out for and being capable of empathy and singled out with people with their own troubles and trials and forces cultural mass political like like covid you wear a mask germany depression everyone's wearing a mask and then all the masks come together 
and commit mask homicide. Because the masks are always a kind of homicide, aren't they? They're the artifacts of homicide. Chris Mask is Chris Mask. Because you wear masks under the moon when the revelry of the Saturnalian initiates turns to murder. Murder by moonlight. And that's where all murder takes place. In the excitement of the revelry under the moon which is God, the shield of artifice, the Lord of death. That's what Christians worship. That's what we all have to worship. It's built into the calendar. This beautiful world, this church of eternal life, is understood. You see a white man comes to the coast, these lands, and they understand it well enough to hurt you and to make you feel like you don't belong here, even if they've just been here for one day. Now just hear me out. God represents the church of the human mind well enough to take jurisdiction over us. To say that he knows our body and our mind and our hearts better than we do. Which is also our land, our language, and our love of the sun and moon and stars in our own hearts and that of our own mothers and fathers. He intrudes. He's a sexual predator. He denudes. He doesn't create. He destroys. He doesn't give birth. He uses. He does not love. And he uses man's innocence. And he bends it to its will. And people with empathy, people like Jews in the Holocaust, they, they didn't dehumanize the people that were dehumanizing them. Yet here they are being singled out. And if they've ever been singled out by a white person, you know that they do it out of some kind of earnest hate for you, but love for everything that's important to them, that you are the symbol, you are the scapegoat, you are the, the suffering mind who's violating their whole culture's ability to deny the suffering mind, to deny their own spirit, and to be able to keep doing that and to live off the drugs that you become addicted to in order to do that, you have to kill people. So a genocidal haze grew out of it. And it can help us understand the North American genocide. Because white people were also involved with that and their God. Remember, the Holocaust was done by the Catholic Church. Let's be clear about that. Let's just be clear about that. Put all the, uh, the occult bullshit to one side. Just think about the control of God over this world and the, and the Rome. Right? You know, you give to Rome what is Rome's, don't you? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Isn't that what that Jesus fuckwit says? And what, in fact, does belong to Caesar? Just the coins with his face on it? Ha <laughs> ha. I laugh at your naivety. <laughs> God takes ownership of everything and everyone. You find your innocence in God or else. God doesn't need to have any judgment, you see. He's got you. And your judgment, severely stymied as it is, is quite useful to him because he's a complex of mass psychological control. The study of which, I think, should be the priority of every single university in the world, starting today. Aside from its STEM subjects and research. That's what every liberal arts student should be thinking about right now. You know, you want your gender to be free, you want to feel like you've got a grip on the future of freedom, then look at the English language. Study the culture around you. And in that note, I, I can connect to the whole, all the young people and whatever they're into. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I imagine it's all very cool. 
very apropos. <laughs> and well dressed, huh? Right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Cause you gotta smell good and look good and move fast. If you're gonna get on and be good and then last, they're gonna find you and you're gonna find me. Like a known enemy in the Bible. What? Like a known enemy in the Bible. What? Like a known like a known, if you think about it, no enemy is like known enemy. Like a known, right? Like a known enemy. Da -na -na. As a friend, as a friend, as a known enemy. When people have a good rapport in any generation, they are not each other's enemy. That's what it means to have someone's back. I am not your enemy. When when a white person does something bad to a white person, they say, and you say, because you know it's narcissistic on TV or anything else, they say, do you hate me? Did I do something to you? Because let's just say that white culture and relationships, mine and yours in some sense, import hostility. <laughs> Without even putting it on anyone, right? They just do. What did I do to you? <laughs> Isn't that weird? Do we not have each other's back? And it's, it's been very torturous for me to live around white people because I could apply that to every relationship. <laughs> like, do you hate me? Do you hate me? And I slowly, because I'm compassionate, they're compassionate, we're compassionate, but I mean, it hurts. And it slowly dawned on me that they see me as their father. Now, not like in the sense like, oh wow, like I'm such a great guy. It's just, it's kind of like when people just see you as an easygoing person, you sort of fill a role and they don't know, they're not conscious of it. But it tells you, even though they're kind of blind in that part of their mind, that however brain dead that humans may be, the fact that they can treat me in the creepy ways they do means that there's still life inside your mind. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to project anything onto me, right? In a sense, there is so much crime shows us that in some sense, our mind is worth saving. Because no one commits a crime, but that the, the whole mind is trying to find a way to live with whatever's happened to it. Now, if that's not compassionate, like Jesus, I don't know what it is. Like, I'm going to start, start getting people to wash my feet. <laughs> Imagine if you could pay people to wash your feet. You come and meet me somewhere and someone comes up and, like, cleans my shoes and, like, say, what's up, bro? <laughs> Girls come along and they just give me flowers. They're so modest. They don't even show their eyes. They're too bashful. <laughs> Plus, I told them on my YouTube site to stop looking at me because it seems to be making them very excited. You know, women, I learned in COVID with the masks, fuck, they can fuck you with their eyes. <laughs> They're looking. No, I shouldn't say that. I mean, narcissistic people or women or young, like eye contact. I mean, I guess we don't really have control, but it's like, like you know, like they're, there's a, the eyes talk. You can tell, I guess in a sense, young people are more alive, so their eyes are more talkative and or they're horny, right? So it's like, okay, your, your eyes are talkative and or you're a horny narcissistic sexual predator, right? <laughs> and you have to kind of keep one possible conclusion on old at all times because in any white relationship, how do you know what kind of rapport you really have? Especially if someone's working, like you're not supposed to be best friends. How do you know you're not a sexual object? You know, I was a young boy. I mean, I'm able to objectify a schoolgirl my own age a hundred times a week. I'm sure, you know, it's like in positions and ways with factories on the edge of town. <laughs> Bells in the distance, slooping up and down of a, a decommissioned tugboat. <laughs> Slippery, eel-like blackness of the gunwales. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't sound very attractive. <laughs> I've watched a lot of CSI Miami. Man, I've seen what lives on in the, in the minds of TV writers. And obviously in human beings. I mean, it's biblical. I love that show, CSI Miami, but it's like, it's fucking biblical, isn't it? I mean, how can you not learn something new about God by watching that? <laughs> Fuck me. There's, there's the fact that I guess these crimes exist and then there's writing about them and imagining them and getting people to watch them and give them a payoff. Like how much evil can they really watch and 
like how do we get to feel like justice is done in, in a theatrical sense and given that we are i guess such such incredible judges of what's appropriate as we watch these things it's like you know what happens to the bad one In the X-Files with the guy who's like a monster created by ethnic cleansing, who lives off of people's livers and then hibernates for 30 years at a time. Um, he's captured, but I don't want to like spoiler alert, you know, don't listen to this, but I mean, he, he sees an opening at the end and it looks like he's going to be able to escape. He's got a freakish ability to change his body and his bones to move through very small places, which is another kind of, kind of interesting metaphorical element too. Like, it's always going to get in. It's like the suffering mind. It's always going to find a way in. And, and yet here, we project it as that of a homicidal murderer. Is that what we think our suffering makes us? Homicidal murderers? I don't think anyone's suffering makes them violent. And I want to say that to people. Like, I know that people listening to this have their own suffering. What's suffering? It can be something that's like nice. It's like a lake. It's like, oh, I'm suffering. <laughs> I'm going to go for a canoe and not think about my suffering <laughs> or it can be like oh everything is my suffering huh look at that i can paint the entire universe of my being with nothing but my own suffering <laughs> it's like hmm, boy i wouldn't you know it'd be great if i could stop doing that <laughs> paint it with non-suffering oh good it's like a brilliant light i'm blind i'm blind <laughs> i have seen the face of god oh god now i've got more suffering but somehow less because i can't see it anymore <laughs> It's so biblical and ironic. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't think that <coughs> suffering makes people violent. I really don't. I, I think that's a distinction that can be made. And I could be wrong, but it is. I think you can feel like it does. I certainly, you know, you, it's fair enough to say that anyone who's violent is, we say they're sick. I've said that a million times. Oh, they're sick, they're sick, they're sick. That's unwell. And what about me? Because it leaves me with a terrible feeling of loss. And I'm not sure if it created the loss or if it's just been agitating it, uh, whether it's been created by violent people or it's created out of my childhood or I just carry this sense of loss around with me. Maybe I'm projecting it on them. Um, how do we know at a certain level in our mind what our pain is and who's causing it? Whether or not we're just sensitive and we have enough pain that things, though painful for, for other people, are just more painful for us. So there's a range of things that are too painful or there's acceptable pain. You know, you stub your toe. You don't think, oh my God, I stubbed my toe. I can't believe I ever stubbed my toe. I can't, I can't go on. I just can't go on. The fact that this can happen, this injustice in the world. Right. <laughs> Why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> I must find out. I'm going to go on a quest. Five minutes later on the internet, you're just looking at gay porn. It's like, I'm still on the quest. <laughs> it's the quest. Look, it says on my desktop, the quest. <laughs> looking for the source of all unnecessary injustice. My dad could just be violent. He could be violent like a character on TV. Like, he could just give you the idea that you should be afraid without touching you. His violence sometimes is just like, you just get really stiff for a while, like a dog, and then bite you. Or you could feel it even most at a distance when he would use other people to disabuse you of your personal space or take something that was just a natural way of feeling, experiencing fear of him to something that when he gets close to you, is just another thing that tells him that you're just, a, there's something wrong with you. How could you behave that way? So that behaving in a way that was reasonable to how you might feel from physical and uh, domestic abuse could be nothing, you know, as he leaned in, and he, but that something is wrong with me. Now that reaffirms hundreds of times how this person sees you. And how are you not going to think, even though you know better, that maybe you deserve this? What if the religion of your dad's people and your mom's family says, you should really just accept this and go on? 
Who do I have to minister to my heart? No one. Who do I, do I complain? No. I go for a long walk around a lake that appears in the rewrite of one of my first novels. Mill Lake in Abbotsford, British Columbia. You know, and I can say this because I grew up, and that is a dirty lake. <laughs> it's full of so much duck poop at this time, <laughs> and and I don't know what. It's very deep. Don't ever fucking go scuba diving in that shit, man, because you'll like end up at Cultus Lake or something. It's like fuck me, man. I I knew without it being told that there's like you just don't spend too much swimming in the center of that lake. Now I don't believe like it could like like suck you down, but there were currents in there. No doubt about it. It's a deep, deep lake, and dirty, very dirty. Lots of soft mud. I don't know what had created it. And I guess there had been a mill there at some point. You could see very old, like just bits of wood sticking out of one end, but that was all, you couldn't, wasn't enough to reconstruct what at all what the area looked like. But like here, actually, they probably had cars or wagons or something that maybe took lumber or materials from one place to the other. It's, this actually used to be like almost like a mini city, <laughs> part of the developing village of the area, and I think they just closed down. So it's got a certain history to it, I think. I could talk all day. And I do. <laughs> But I would go for a walk. My dad took us for a sail ride on the lake once, and I was sailing with him. And I thought he was going really high. That you know he liked to sail and it was fun. And I thought I had to lean back on the edge of the boat. I was scared, but I trusted my dad. And then he took my little brother out, and they capsized, and he lost half the mast. Um, so the boat just sat in the garage until one day I think we just sold it or threw it out. That was the last time we had a sail. But my dad loved to sail. He liked to take it out. You know, he liked to really go as fast as he could. And I think I would have done things differently. You know, if I took my children out sailing. And he knew enough about sailing. You know, it's like, I don't know. I I would just sort of find a nice, even speed. And uh, see if anyone else wants to, you know, steer the boat or something, because isn't that what children like to do? Give them a little responsibility, get a feel for being on a, a, a vessel and having some control of where it goes. I mean, just think what a young mind can do for that, you know? Teach them the little parts of the boat. My dad did do that. He wanted me to know where the center board was and the rudder and the jib sail. That much I enjoyed. I enjoyed learning. What is port? What is starboard? My dad taught me that. But that was it. He never really let me steer. He liked to do everything on my older brother. And I really liked being on the boat with him because I always felt safe, really. And then over time, I didn't feel safe around my dad anymore. Ever. I never would ever again, you know. As Dr. Phil would say, you know, you got your deal breakers. You have to have that, you know. You have to have a basic standard. And the thing is that you're growing up with an abusive individual like my father is, you don't really develop standards. And you, the standards you develop are very accommodating for him. And I didn't grow up with a great sense of injustice because I guess the one thing that public school did to me is it gave me another place to be afraid, but it gave me something to do about it, unlike home, which is just homework. So I got really good at school because it was just another place I was afraid and out of place. I better, this is all I can do, I specialized. Now, today they probably call that autism or Asperger's, but it's no failure of mine. I understand and appreciate that like it's fair to give names to things because it's just recognizing that there's some hurt or something and 
and it's really meant out of compassion to help people um, learn how to enjoy their lives more, if you would say, if you're a mental health person. But I, I take offense at those terms. Just because I haven't built a strong social sense of self doesn't mean that I don't have an ego. I think mental health people treat people like they're the Buddha, like they're children, like they should just, they just want to help them, so you should just like, you know, be totally obedient to everything they tell you and uh, accept the little weird names they give in the mind. And that's all fell and good to them, but to me it's like a way of letting them sexually abuse you. Like, they forget that you have a mind. Like, just because you're in a depression clinic doesn't mean your life is over that you need to be defined by any of this. This is certainly bad. Certainly life isn't going well when you're depressed. I was sitting in a smoke room in a mental clinic in Abbotsford for depressed and otherwise mentally ill people smoking cigarettes. My mom, the best part of my day, she'd come and bring me a pack of cigarettes. Probably like player's light or something. God, I love those things. And you could smoke in there. You could sit there with a cup of coffee and smoke a cigarette. Ridiculous, right? This white woman came in and gave me a lap dance. I didn't know it was sexual assault, and the nurses who clearly saw this never reported it, except to say that I had actually sexually abused her. And I didn't even know what was happening. It was over my head. I was too busy. Like, and so you see, like, white women and white people are always stalking, like, because they're always capable of committing perversion. They always have to be able to control their prey and protect people that are closer to them, their own gender, for instance, right? The thing is that this woman, Tanya, she didn't even seem to really have a problem. She just didn't want to go home to her husband. And she would take the nurse's time by pretending to kill herself and tying ridiculous little nooses for herself to go hang herself in her bed. You know what I would have done if I was her doctor? I'd say, go fucking hang yourself, right? We'll just alert you know, the city coroner to expect your body, all right? Just go do it and just call her bluff, you know, just a sophisticated narcissist. And they can be very cheerful. She took a liking to me, very friendly, but I mean, they're complete psychopaths. You know, and they know things about you. They see things about you. They think you're cool and uh, they don't mind sexually assaulting you because this is how white women treat their friends. This is how they grow up. This is normal to them. She's not in a mental health clinic because she's a nymphomaniac or a psychopath. And yet I come out of there being called like half a dozen different things without even being notified of it. They're not giving her powerful antipsychotics without telling her to see if they can break her mind. But that's what they did to me. Right? It's just, it's what they do. I'm not judging it. It's like, that's what they do. Right? You don't know what you're going to say to a psychiatrist that's going to give them permission to do that. They can chemically sexually assault you. And the nurses, I don't think in, in the thousands and thousands of hours of every mental health nurse in North America that uh, they've ever seen or heard of such a thing. It's incredible. White people's minds are incredible at compartmentalizing, right? And you're not supposed to complain. And nobody does. Because why would you? You just deal. I did what my mom always did living around white psychopaths. You just be nice and take the next step. I came to the nurse's station. I said, could I have the, uh, the antidote? I need an antidote. I need something. And they gave it to me without even asking me why I needed it. And then I was able to go back to sleep. They gave me a mind-altering substance without telling me. And then I had to come and get an antidote. I was in a lot of mental pain, right? I was seeing Jesus in my head, you know? Like, I was, I've never been in so much mental pain in my life. They like it went down into my brain core. So I was probably experiencing a very a rush of my suffering mind. And the, probably the first image that comes to mind when you're being fucking tortured in a Christian town is probably Jesus Christ. Because really the face of Jesus Christ is on money. It's fucking everywhere. It's just another mask in the ancient gallery. Right? It's not stupid for a mental patient to talk and think about Jesus. Right? It's fucking everywhere. It's like being in an ocean of shit and talking about feces. Right? Jesus is feces. You know? And my mind was in an extremely distressed state, you know? really hurt. It was like a bad headache. It was like awful. Things I'd never experienced before in my life, so I knew something was wrong. You know? Really scared. It's funny, you know, they tell you not to smoke weed, and then they give you that. You're in a strange place. You're sensitive. 
You see, the thing about psychopaths that you can't prove is that they really know their prey. They know. They know wherever they work, wherever they live, exactly what they can get away with. They've got room to play. They got room to play. The psychopath will find room to play. Why do you think we get people in all these occupations? They need room to play, right? There are white female nurses need room to believe that they're almost doctors. That's how they get them into the schools. With the unspoken promise that four years of nursing is almost as good as being a doctor. There's even a YouTube video of a nurse showing you that over the course of her career, you, a nurse should expect to actually start making decisions that a doctor is supposed to make and they'll let you. So daddy can give you more and more power. So you can advance in your godlike power over your patients. Now, it's not really their fault. That's a systemic error in leadership and the proper staffing of hospitals. But, you know, it's there. And it, it's a study in itself of the insouciant narcissistic disorder of white people and their entire sort of God universe. It can be studied like that. So, you know, you, I had other things to do. And so people don't complain about sexual abuse or chemical that's chemical sexual abuse, which, by the way, was visited on me again by another doctor several years later, um, and I believe uh, in a way related to this other doctor whose medication I, I stopped taking. And uh, they just sat there quietly, and it's, you know, and eventually they get you back, right? They were just as bad as my dad. They actually, like white people, can take it personally when you stop your medication. They can take it personally, you see, a psychopath that is when they don't have the control they feel they should have, that you've taken it away from them. Because they have no control of themselves, but they don't suffer a lot of, at least not to them, apparently neurotic problems because of the silencing of their voice, which is really the disjunction of their mind. The dislocation, right? The perversion of their brain chemistry. Not just their brain chemistry, Regardless of the brain chemistry, the organs of the brain and their ability to make sense of what's happening to the tissues of the human body, which millions of years of evolution have given it the absolute masterful jurisdiction of attempting to do. And that's what God's competing with. And that's what mental health practitioners are competing with. They don't realize it, right? Your brain is like a wild horse kicking and they're basically coddle prodding it into submission. She probably even thought she was doing something good for me. She probably didn't intend to hurt me. It's like, hey, why not? Why not shove these fucking drugs in him and see what happens? If he doesn't like it, he'll tell us. But she didn't tell me. You understand? That's like someone, it's like consenting to have sex with someone who has herpes to see how it's going to affect you. Because, you know, they've got an antidote and don't worry, you can treat it. And I just wanted to see if I could give it to somebody. How is that any different than rape? All rape is a robbery. It's a thieving of something that belongs to you. To bring it back around, it's humiliating. And what do people do when they're humiliated? <coughs> they go back to the earth. I went back to the goddess. In my own naive way, I worshiped the mother goddess. In my little poetry, I didn't have to develop my own religion or read Gardner's neo-paganism, although I did read parts of it and drawing down the moon. And these things interested me. They gave me a feel of... I didn't want to show you these black and white pictures of people in the 80s or 70s all just dressed up like witches and acting like witches and making pentagrams. It's like a cosmetic alteration of the mind. Oh, you know, be a witch, right? This is what witches look like. It's ridiculous. Witches look like just about anybody. You would not even know that someone is a witch. You might even not even know if you're a witch. Much less which witch, which witch you are. <laughs> and with which, what switch you're going to sweep us off our feet. <laughs> and clean the leaves off of the forest floor. And make a way for the Lord himself, who gave us life like the sun. Shit, I'm bear. I better get going.
Those dogs are really going nuts. Time to go. Time to go. Let's get up. It's time to go, Mr. Christian. Why are you calling me Mr. Christian? Because that's your name, isn't it? No. You're not Christian Bale? No. You're not Hans Christian Anderson? No. I hear people. You're not Christian Slater? That was probably blasting somewhere. Oh, fuck. Hmm. Oh, man. So people say, like, what the Christ or Jesus Christ? I think, why do we say Jesus Christ? Why was I thinking of Jesus Christ when I was feeling mentally tortured in a strange place? Why do we say Jesus Christ when we're angry? Wh whose name are we saying? It's like the name of the whole English language. It's everything that's taught us to depend on it and its pills to survive. You know? Maybe I'd seen Jesus Christ and I would have said, you know what? Don't worry, man. You're becoming Jesus Christ. And I'd get up the next day and say, my psychiatrist is okay. You know, I felt a huge sense of humiliation and utter betrayal that I projected onto you in murderous rage. But then I realized that Jesus was saving me and that Jesus is inside my mind hanging on a cross right now. He's looking at me going, Hey, what's up, baby? Well, spit and blood. And having every kind of bodily injury that I've ever had, multiple times from my sexually predatory father. Not that you or your predecessors or contemporaries are going to care. And two or three years, you're going to sit in a room with him and sexually humiliate me again. But don't worry, I'm going to use it for good. <laughs> because, because I was thinking today, no matter what evil you experience, you, you really can use it for good. I don't mean that in any violent sense. I just, I don't mean like turn it around and get vengeance. I mean like just genuine self-care. Self-love through the unfortunate evils of the world humiliating you. <laughs> it's sending you like a foul wind in a new and perhaps better direction. You know, I mean, white people are like white signs. They tell you where to go. And I just always go away from white people. And it's amazing in my travels how you have the best experiences always avoiding white people where you can without being in the street going somewhere else turning the other way take the other path i quite frankly don't even like walking by them i find them obnoxious it sounded like my stomach just beat <laughs> there are microchips in this coffee <laughs> it's a homing signal it's like jason Bourne. they're sending a drone after me do you hear something <laughs> That's the last thing you'll hear me say. It's like, do you hear something? I'll stop like a deer. Like Jason Bourne, wait, do you hear something? And then I'd be like, whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Suddenly, I'll realize my own significance. <laughs> if you can do that, you know, within about 10 nanoseconds. <laughs> I have, I'll have 10 nanoseconds to realize the full significance of my life work. <laughs> and I'll be like, thank you, God. <laughs> That's God's mercy. <laughs> and God will say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> Then on the news, we come on and be like, the world has lost one of its worst poets today. <laughs> YouTube loser, Rain Griffin, finally spontaneously combusted <laughs> after talking too much shit about white people and the Christian Bible. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to all of you. <laughs> now back to, in honor of rain, oh, the naked version of the popular TV show Friends, 
were digitally remastered so that none of them have their clothes, except for the guys who remain fully dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <coughs> oh, hold it. That's the rest of the Okay, let's go. Woo! Yes, the future of gayness. Gayness without the anus. Gayness sans anus. <laughs> hey, that, that would be a good name for me. Gayness sans anus. And now, our next guest, Gayness sans anus. Now, tell me about your name, Gayness sans anus. Sans anus? What does it actually mean? <laughs> It means gayness without the ass. <laughs> it means ask me no questions, give me no lies. <laughs> if you're bleeding profusely, apply a lot of pressure. <laughs> Sanguinus Aquinas. <laughs> he bleeds from his anus in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Which, as it turns out, <laughs> is the name of the Lord. So that works out quite well. <laughs> I haven't spontaneously combusted it should tell people that I'm actually a pretty good person. <laughs> of course. I don't know. I think the whole standard of good people is going for shit. What is a good person these days, you know? They swipe left? <laughs> a good person swipes left. Sometimes right. Sometimes you have to mix it up. To get the ass completely clean. <laughs> it's, it's the new app. Tender. Love me softly. <laughs> Love me true. Love me tender, please be kind while you're treating my behind. <laughs> Leave it swollen, that's okay. I don't need to uh, sit down <laughs> today. <laughs> Because I say, lady, I've just got one more thing to say to you. And uh, I don't know. I don't need your love. No. Forrest Gump on a safari. I know what dung is. I was just putting it in my mouth to see what the lion ate today. <laughs> it looked like a piece of chocolate, but also dung. And I have the intelligence that can hold two completely different things in my mind at the same time, Jenny. <laughs> I simply didn't come down in one firm decisional kind of aspect about the relative merits of the two parallel conclusions about that beautiful lump of chocolate I found on our survival. <laughs> it could have been one of the chocolates my mother was referring to. 
when life is full of it. <laughs> it's so ironic, Jenny. My man, my mind is starting to explode. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to write a movie about. It. <laughs> oh. He'll call it elephant tard. Elephantard. Elephantard by Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump writes a movie. I think that'd be great. It's called I Know What Love Is. <laughs> and we find out what Forrest Gump actually thinks. <laughs> Love actually is. <laughs> Let's see what Forrest Gump thinks love actually is. I'd love to see a movie like that. <laughs> love is a new video game every week from Video Game of the Week. It's a shrimp boat captain who doesn't even need to have legs <laughs> and doesn't need med medical. <laughs> okay, stop. Stop. That's too funny. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, Lieutenant Dan, Lieutenant Dan, come over here. In my movie, I'm giving you legs. <sighs> You're like a story in the Daily Planet <laughs> about a man who eventually lost his legs, but used to be a man of stew. <laughs> I get away with this? I don't know. Because it's fun. Foon. It's foon. Wander foon. Did you have foon today, my darling? Dad, it's not called foon. It's called fun. Yes, but in the future, aren't words going to be different? Different things mean different things. Like stoke used to be something you do to a, to a fire. And now it's like just because you're excited about doing something from fertilizing your best friend to playing a new video game to <clears throat> jumping out of a helicopter and flying down onto a giant volcano and skiing to the bottom. <laughs> That's what Foon is going to be. Foon is going to be fun removed from all possible danger. So I call sitting in my bomb shelter Foon. <laughs> <laughs> Because, son, son, when all the shit goes down, and the government and all the black robot people come and take everyone away, there's not going to be any more fun. No, there's just going to be food. <laughs> <laughs> you better get it soon. <laughs> That's my kind of food. The one where I get to stay alive and still do it. <laughs> No more fun in those days. I'm saying that son, no more fun at all. <laughs> it's just food. It's my, it's my word. It's a way of life, really. <laughs> I try to keep a little fun. Then I'm not missing anything when God takes all of it away. Oh, you know, there's a certain amount of truth to that. It's like, oh, don't have too much food. <laughs> and then a thousand years later, somebody will be like, hey, Enough of this foon business. I want to have fun. And I'll be like, that's so weird. Fun. Did you hear what this guy said? <laughs> What's that? Oh, it's it's different than foon. You know, it's not as safe, but it's more fun. Oh, like what? <laughs> 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 and so <they're> like... <laughs> it's like, what if... What if we open up this bomb shelter and expose our skin to the light of common day? <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> that wouldn't be very foon at all. <laughs> well, it might not be foon, but wouldn't it be nice to get fresh air and walk around like a normal person? It's like, hmm, you make a good point. <laughs> Come on, everyone. Let's have some fun. Why? It's the new thing. <laughs> that was how people came out of their caves in the ground. Pretty soon, they forgot that they used to live in caves in the ground called bomb shelters that protected them from so many things. Oh, they ceased to really be human at all. An angry god cast a vague and 
benighting scowl upon them from the faces of their gods of old who had been slain by a new kind of song which pronounced their lives, however dreary, of having that thin, tiny hope at the end of a long, fecal ridden tunnel of daily doils and tortures that their mind imagined somewhat more euphoric than they were because sometimes the serotonin took a wrong turn between the hippocampus and the medulla oblongata. has ever laughed this hard. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Ooh.